move on to new business items. Um, there were no council additions, so we'll go to 7.2, evacuation plan presentation and discussion. Ms. LaBelle. Uh, thank you very much. I'll just bring up the presentation here. Okay, perfect. Um, handed out in front of council is a large copy of the presentation, as well as a copy of the um, Northern Rockies Regional Municipality and Fort Nelson First Nations EVAC plan, which this presentation has been based on. So essentially the presentation is just a more visually friendly version of a very text heavy document. So um, everything that is inside of the presentation is can be is contained inside of the formal evacuation plan. So um, feel free to stop me at any time with any questions that you may have. <clears throat> so I'm just going to start off with just a, a quick overview. Um, the Northern Rockies has what we call the Local Comprehensive Emergency Management Plan. It is a very fulsome document that contains a number of, um, it contains a copy of the Emergency Management Plan, um, as well as several appendices and what we call annexes. The annexes are all standalone plans that um, serve a different business unit of the organization or a different business purpose. So inside of an annex, you've got our potable water emergency response plan, you've got our airport response plan, you have our business continuity plans, our community wildfire protection plans, and um, different things like that. And one of the annex, annex number six, is our evacuation plan. So that is the, the document that I handed out here. Um, I thought I would just start off just really quickly. We have um, essentially 10 hazards within the province of British Columbia. Not all of these are going to require evacuation, of course, um, and not all of these are relevant or applicable within the Northern Rockies. So um, within our area, of course, our number, I'm going to say our number one, two, and three uh, risks are going to be wildfires, hazardous material spills, power outages, and severe weather. Um, those are probably our biggest ones that, that we are facing. Only a couple of those require uh, evacuations. Okay, could I just pause you for a moment, yeah. please? Mayor, do you have a question? I did, Erin. I just wanted to ask if uh, that entire document uh, with all the annexes is, yeah, that one, it, the, the, is that available on the webpage? Is that a, a, a document that's available to the public? It is a document that is generally available to the public. We pulled it down to update it for the new emergency and disaster um, mitigation legislation. So we had to change all of our um, references to the old Emergency Program Act. So we've got, I'm gonna say 90% of them updated and they will be updated here probably by the end of this month. And then pretty much everything will be available except those things that are listed as protected. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So we have um, essentially three types of evacuations um, within uh, emergency management. The first one I'm just gonna reference is a tactical evacuation. These are used often by emergency services such as fire departments or RCMP to clear an area around a hazard. So this would be when we had um, a gas leak down in Midtown, fire department conducted a tactical evacuation. It's usually done through a door knocking exercise um, and people are asked to evacuate immediately. One other thing that I've listed here over on the far right is called shelter in place. And shelter in place is, is that shelter in place is essentially when people are directed to shelter in buildings until an emergency situation has um, has been mitigated. This is often used in a uh, airborne emergency when you don't want people exiting a building. We use shelter in place at our rec center for ammonia leaks because you don't want people exiting the buildings because they're not aware of where the hazard is. And while it um, doesn't typically get thought of as an evacuation, it is considered an evacuation because you are controlling the population, essentially. Um, what I'm going to focus on for this presentation is a planned evacuation where we hope we have adequate warning about the threat or hazard and we have time to communicate and coordinate the evacuation. So that's what this presentation is going to sort of be focusing on. I have another question. Yeah. You're going to hate me probably. Is no. that, 
Is the shelter in place evacuation the same as a tactical evacuation? Yeah, you know, or do we need uh, do we need uh, a state of emergency to declare it? So um, you don't need a state of emergency for either a tactical or a shelter in place because the responding agency has the authority for life safety to um, control the movement of people. But what we often do is in the case of either a tactical or shelter in place, we would do the paperwork, i.e. declare the state of local emergency and issue the evacuation order after the fact, which would allow those residents who may be um, displaced as a result of a tactical evacuation or those who may be stuck in a shelter in place to access any emergency uh, support services because we would need that state of local emergency and evacuation order for them to be able to access access those supports. So we would do the paperwork behind the fact just to sort of clean everything up. Okay, thanks. There are um, several groups responsible um, and involved in an evacuation. And this particular, I'm gonna call it a very loose Venn diagram. Um, I sort of designed this if we were doing an evacuation for a wildfire hazard. So um, sitting at the center is the um, emergency operations center and our job is planning coordination information and we have the authority under the legislation to issue that evacuation order. None of these other agencies have that actual authority. Um, I'm going to start in the top uh, right hand corner and work my way clockwise. So BC wildfire services, they are in a case of a wildfire would be the responding emergency agency that is going to be um, conducting the incident um, site command. They would also be doing any hazard assessments. They would be communicating with the EOC about the scene, about the wildfire, and doing any of those hazard assessments required. Emergency management and climate readiness is the provincial agency that would provide us with regional and provincial coordination, and it would also assist us with many of the other agencies. Um, MODI and Public Works and Procurement Canada, we would be dealing with them to um, coordinate road transportation cor corridors if we were doing a road evacuation. We would be utilizing our airport staff to make sure that our airport remains safe to be able to land planes. Um, they would work with BC Ambulance, who is going to be assisting with the evacuation of Port Nelson General Hospital and all of the other care centers in the region. Northern Health would be doing the evacuation of the hospital and their long-term care. And they would also assist us with the identification of any residents who may need assistance. We would utilize the um, public health staff. We would utilize any staff who has knowledge of residents within the community who might need assistance. Our CMP actually conduct and enforce the evacuation. So if we were to switch from the wildfire being the incident to the evacuation now being the incident, the RCMP actually takes incident command because they have the legislative authority to conduct the evacuation and to enforce it. Um, on top of the RCMP would be resource allocation. This would be any of our community partners or any of the resources that we require to assist and support the RCMP with that evacuation. Over on the other side is human resources. So the RCMP through EMCR, the Emergency Management and Climate Readiness Ministry, have the ability to um, task different agencies to assist with um, the evacuation. So in this example, I have search and rescue and the Canadian Rangers who would help with an evacuation. All right. So what I did is I prepared sort of a bit of a Three Can I ask stage. One question? Yes. Thank you. You want um, me to go back? Yes, please. I I, <laughs> I need to understand a little better your comments around uh, if we declare uh, a state of emergency and we uh, determine that evacuation is needed, that as soon as if it was from a wildfire, as soon as we declare that evacuation is needed, it switches to the RCMP and they take control? Is that correct? They, take con they would take control of the evacuation. They would conduct the evacuation. They become the incident command for the evacuation only. Okay, so at that point, there'd be two incident command centers in the community. Or would they be there working could be. out of our... 
Oh, or would it make sense that they'd be working out of our EOC to do that? They could be. So um, the BC, um, BCIRMS regulation, we would use a unified command structure. Right. Okay. Yeah. But it might not happen in the same place. It might not happen in the same place. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So um, the first stage of a three stage of a planned evacuation is an evacuation alert. Um, so during an evacuation alert, I just made some notes about what sort of some of the focus areas would be. So on a, as an EOC, our focus would be communications, preparation and planning. We would be focusing on vulnerable populations and the identification of those who may need assistance to evacuate. We would uh, start to reduce or have a reduction of non-essential governance services. We would work with the RCMP to finalize the potential evacuation routes. We would arrange logistics such as buses, planes, and other resources, and we would pre-locate them close to the community. So during an alert, uh, we would look at getting buses up from Fort St. John and pre-locating them in the community. We would pre-locate things such as porta potties, traffic control, all bring them closer to the community. community. So if we needed them, we could then um, deploy those. We would need to contact potential host communities and set up emergency support services. And on alert, we have the ability to begin arrangements for the evacuation of commercial livestock where that is feasible. Okay. Um, I just picked out a couple of areas that I thought would be really important to sort of talk about. Um, one of the ones would be communications. So public communications and notifications for a community evacuation alert. Um, when you look at communications, you always want to start with your broadest, um, your broadest communication process first and use that one first. So starting from the top, during an evacuation alert, we would use our buoyant alert system and the provincial alert ready system. We would also utilize radio broadcasts. We would utilize social media and our website. We have a number of direct contact with some support groups within our community that have those um, links to the vulnerable population in our community. So we would begin to utilize those. We would use news releases. We would set up a public information lines that people could call to say, um, you know, to get clarity, to gain information if they don't have access to the internet. We would also publicly state that if anybody requires assistance to be evacuated, they could sort of register. They would give us their information, their address, what type of assistance would be needed, and we could start to create a list of those folks. We um, have in the past, we've done printed notices at common public gathering spaces. We would do both commercial and residential. So we would do things like gas stations, apartment building lobbies, any place that we would reach multiple people. Um, and last choice at this stage would be a door to door. So that is our last choice, just because that, that is a um, quite an endeavor to do in a community, even a small one of our size. But if required, we would do door to door. We would probably do door to door in some of our um, areas with some of our vulnerable population. So we would absolutely do door to door in a Grace Manor situation, but we may not do it down in, um, you know, in Midtown in a general population subdivision, but we would definitely do it in where we knew we had a number of vulnerable populations. So Um, again, we would start with the method, method with the broadest reach. We would ensure that our messaging is standard, consistent, and credible across all of our sources. We would ensure that we align with our community partners, including any First Nations, RCMP, BC Wildfire, Public Services and Procurement Canada, Modi, and et cetera. And then one of our biggest jobs is always ensuring that we have regular updates. Try to keep the residents and the population as up-to-date as possible on any new um, any new information. Okay. <clears throat> Some of the activities that are going on in the EOC, we are going to be inquiring those necessary resources and pre-positioning transportation, such as buses, aircraft, fuel supply. We would be coordinating human resources required for the evacuation operations. So we would work with the RCMP, Northern Rockies Fire Rescue, and our own public works crew. We would be confirming critical and RRM operational functions, such as water, fire service, and we would be activating our business continuity plans. And we would work with host community ESS partners to establish reception centers in our destination communities. Um, 
One of our, our biggest focus during an evacuation alert would be our vulnerable population. So this is just a bit of a sniff of some of the information that we have. I'm just going to move. Oh, that's you, Jay. <laughs> Perfect, thanks. <laughs> this is just um, a little bit of a sniff about um, how we identified our vulnerable population. So this is based on the 2021 census. The first column is the entire Northern Rockies Regional Municipality, including all First Nations. So our total population is just under 4,500 and just over 2,500 total dwellings with only 1,900 um, occupied. Of course, we would probably never, I'm gonna knock that wood here, evacuate our entire municipality. That's 85,000 square kilometers. So I'm gonna focus on the next two columns over, which is the Fort Nelson community, which census calls basically the old town site, our town with FNFN, because we have basically, if we are evacuating, there's a high likelihood that they would also be evacuating. So together we are approximately just over 3000 people. We have 1800 dwellings. We only have 1300 dwellings occupied though. So when you think about household groups that you're going to need to provide support for on the other end, According to Census Canada, we only have about 1,300 of those as occupied dwellings. So um, in age ranges, we have just over 600 in the age bracket, 0 to 14, just over 2,000 that are 15 to 64, and 365 that are over the age of 65. Um, a total children count is 810, and our total 70 plus is 185. So those would be the two age brackets that we would consider to be uh, vulnerable, both the young and the seniors. Um, one of the other areas that emergency managers consider to be a person, a vulnerable person could be total one person households. So one person households often don't have the means or the ability to evacuate themselves. So within Fort Nelson and FNFN, we have 475 one person households. We have 195 one parent families. So those again are those who may need a little bit more assistance. Um, and in the income streams, individuals without income, we have 75 individuals without stated income within our two communities. Those household incomes or households with a take home less than 70,000, we have 654. And on the low income measurement on an individual, we have 465. So when you think about those percentages, and when you think about people who are probably in more than one of those categories, we figure we're approximately 50% vulnerable population, which gives us 676 households that we would need to provide additional support to that would not be able to self-evacuate, i.e. pack their own home, get in their own car and drive to Fort St. John, for instance. So, when we're talking planning and when we're giving numbers to host communities, those are the types of numbers and those are the types of people that we are planning for. Those, those are the numbers that we think we might need to provide transportation to, whether it be bus or aircraft. So um, that's sort of just a, a bit of a sniff about some of the information that we have. All right, moving on to stage two. So stage two is an evacuation order. Our focus in the EOC is going to be communications, coordination, resource allocation, transportation, and operational support for the evacuation. Once the evacuation is complete, we would be coordinating and issuing access permits. So if people need back into the evacuation area for a legitimate reason, there is an access permit process. We would also be maintaining situational awareness and providing updates, um, updated information to all of our residents. In order to uh, communicate a community evacuation order, we use a lot of the same um, sources that we did the first time, um, except we add a couple. <clears throat> so again, all of our alert systems, radios, we also use would use loudspeakers on emergency vehicles driving through uh, neighborhoods. We would use social media and our website again, again, those contact lists, news releases, our emergency information line, public notices. But we would also, we would absolutely do a door-to-door -door system. And we have a door-to-door -door system. I'm just going to reach across here. So um, when you do a door-to-door -door evacuation notice, you send your door knockers out with um, a set of flagging tapes. It is color coordinated, and it is all printed with a notice. So 
Um, if you look in your evacuation plan on page, I'll find my little pictures here. If you look in your evacuation plan on page 18, you'll see a picture of the flagging tape. So it has um, blue for not home. So this would mean that a door knocker has um, gone to the home. They were, uh, nobody was home. So they would take a chunk of this flagging tape. They would attach it to that home in a visible area. So when emergency services are driving by, they would know that that home did not have a person to person contact made. Um, the yellow would be evacuated. So if an emergency um, individual made contact with an individual at that home and that individual indicated that they were evacuating, they would leave this piece of tape with them. So then ask the resident, tie this on your house somewhere so that when you leave, um, emergency response personnel, when they're doing their neighborhood checks would know that that house had been evacuated. We have um, notified. So this one would be used if there was contact made, um, but the individual was still in the home but hadn't left yet. And then you would leave them the yellow to ask them to tie it on their house when they did leave. Okay. You have red. This means I need help. So if you, as a door knocker, come across somebody who needs some assistance, they don't have a vehicle, they need some kind of help, they would record the address, they would record the help required, and then they would leave this flagging tape on that house visible somewhere. Um, and then when the emergency services were going by that they would know that person needed help. We've also got refused. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about refused in a couple slides, but if a person, an individual does refuse an evacuation, you would tie this uh, ribbon onto their home so that once the evacuation was complete, when during the patrols of the community, uh, those individuals would not be surprised to see a person at this home. So you know that that person, that home was still occupied. These are standard colors used throughout the entire province. Um, the RCMP, BC Wildfire, um, Fire Rescue, we all use the same colors. Um, so I'm just gonna talk just a little bit about um, one of the evacuation methods, which is gonna be always our first choice, which is gonna be road. Um, we would use personal vehicles for those able to self-evacuate, and we would do supply transportation for those who require assistance. Um, for anybody who lives here, you know we've only got really two ways out of town. So, so both routes pose some challenges. Um, one is, of course, a greater distance than the other, but just because if we go south, we do have to realize our final destination may not be Fort St. John. When you think 1,300 homes, residents, family units that are evacuating this community, there will not be 1,300 rooms available in Fort St. John. So we could be going further. We could be going as far as Prince George. We could be going into the Chetwinds. We could be going into the Dawson Creeks. We could be going into the Tumbler Ridges. We could be going all the way down to Prince George. Um, between Fort Nelson and Fort St. John, we know we would want to provide what I call comfort stations. So we, would, uh, we have designated rest areas where we would set up internet with our Starlinks. We would um, put in porta potties or additional porta potties if there already were some there, such as trutch, and we would want to supply drinking water. We know we would probably also need to enter a fuel arrangement with any fuel suppliers between here and Fort St. John to provide residents with some fuel. That is a 400 to 800 to 900 kilometer trip. Not everybody has the means to, at a moment's notice, purchase that much fuel for a vehicle. If you also think that a lot of these vehicles are going to be recreational vehicles that are going to use a lot more fuel than others. So we do know that we're going to have to provide fuel. So we have had those conversations in advance with emergency uh, management climate readiness ministry, and they are prepared to support providing fuel to our residents for evacuation purposes. North, uh, North could be as far as Whitehorse or even worse. If Whitehorse from a commercial lodging um, perspective was completely full, we are going up and over. We're going up and over and back down Highway 37 to the terrace area, which is an even longer distance. So again, we would need to provide comfort stations, but this becomes a huge logistical challenge for things such as fuel. If anybody's driven Highway 37, there is not a lot to stop between the, um, when you come out of the Yukon until you head down into Deese Lake. 
um, very few rest areas, not a lot of pullouts for RVs. And we know we would need traffic control for pinch points such as Steamboat Mountain, where the first sign of internet signal, everyone's gonna to come to a screeching halt and wanna pull over. So. so we have plans for both of those routes. We've got designated areas where we would establish internet, porta potties. We would also establish pullouts for RVs in places such as the Tetsa River gravel um, pit. Thank you. I lost a word there for a second. We've been working with Public Works and Procurement Canada to be able to also coordinate the gravel pit at Adset Creek just before Prophet River, uh, the one on the right hand side, so that we could coordinate that for a pullout station. We've also chatted with Public Works and Procurement Canada about the Prophet River airstrip and potentially even creating an exit at the far south end so you can have a one way because right now when you come in at the north end and you go down the airstrip you have to come back to the north to get out that creates a bit of a traffic hazard so we've talked about punching in an exit at the south end if needed um because we know people um are not going to be moving quickly it's going to be a lot more than a four hour drive if we have to go south so we have these planned um increments and stages to get people so with areas they can stop, breathe, rest, let the kids out, do whatever they need to do. So um, our always goal would be a south route, but if we have to go north, we have those plans in place as well. Just a note for those requiring transportation, i.e. bus or medical assistance, north is an absolutely not a feasible route. We cannot send vulnerable populations who require medical assistance or those on a bus north. The round trip, it would take every bus we ever, ever have, and they would be gone for 12 hours. So we need quick turnaround. So if we are forced into a north evacuation route, our choice is to send our people who require transportation out by plane. So that would be our, our absolute choice if we have to do a north ground um, road evacuation. So we'll chat a little bit about air. <laughs> so aircraft. Um, about seven years ago, we had the Canadian Forces here and we chatted about their aircraft and their availabilities with the uh, Hercules out of Comox and how long it would take to get the couple of Hercules that sit in Saskatchewan. We would also use commercial and charter aircraft from Canada North, from Buffalo Air, from any of the number of the charter companies that operate in the North, including local villas. One of the things that we have to make sure, if at all possible, that our runways have adequate visibility to land. So that is the key. Um, some of the, again, the challenges and resource with air transportation, it would require several round trips for an entire community evacuation, which is why we would prefer a bit of a hybrid. Those who can go by ground would go and we would just use air for those who absolutely need it. Because the individuals are absolutely restricted, especially on Canadian Forces aircraft to limited personal belongings. You're not taking everything. You're taking what you can carry. Um, pets are allowed on Canadian Forces aircraft. Um, they must be in carriers or on leashes. And if it's a larger dog or a, a dog um, with sort of a, a muzzle, and that is always at the pilot's discretion of the Canadian of a Canadian Forces aircraft. Um, depending upon the commercial or charter aircraft that we get, they that also could be up in the air, depending on where pets would be allowed in the cabins. So, um, we would um. Be, so air would be used during a road evacuation, again, to remove those vulnerable populations. And the Fort Nelson General Hospital would move all of the medically compromised individuals by air, and they would be going to probably Prince George or south to Vancouver, where they could have the medical services that are required. In this instance, would they be returned home? <laughs> I would hope so. <laughs> I would absolutely hope so. <laughs> Yeah, it's, that is a good question. Um, so if we are doing a road uh, road evacuation, some of the resources we're gonna need are some motor vehicles. So um, buses, we know we've locally got diversified transportation who holds the bus contract for school district um, 81. And now that they are dismissing school on an alert, those buses have now become a little bit more available to us. Fort Nelson First Nation also has a bus that is, um, they have enough bus capacity to evacuate all of their elders via coach so they can take care of their elders. But we also have within the community hotel buses. Um, so any of the hotels that have a, a little shuttle bus we would utilize. And there's also other contractors that we would use out of Fort St. John, probably again, the diversified transport. Um, 
Diversified Transport in town does have eight buses that hold 46 people each. They are not coaches. These are, I'm going to call them the cheese bus. These are the school buses. There are four newer, four older, um, but they are reliable coach. There are reliable buses that we could get people and we would be comfortable getting people a short distance, not a long distance, but a short distance. Um, we also have specialized buses in the community, the Northern Health Bus, the Senior Society Bus. Um, Northern Health would probably utilize both their bus and the Senior Society Bus to evacuate any people that require um, medical assistance or mobility. Those buses could also be used to shuttle people between their homes and a staging area. Um, so we would be able to utilize those short term. We wouldn't want to take any of those up for a long term because they could be better utilized in the community. Residents would always be encouraged to assist each other wherever possible. So um, if you have a, if you're a family of, of two and you have three vehicles, um, somebody may be able to drive your third vehicle out. That's always an option if you have that insurance. Um, we always encourage people to help a neighbor, do carpooling, do whatever you can to help people out. Um, within the community, we may be able to use municipal and emergency response vehicles to get people from their homes to a staging area while we wait for a bus to return from a, a run down the highway. In terms of aircraft, I already chatted about the Hercules, but we also have charters through local and non-local operators, Villar, CMA, Pacific Coastal, Canadian North, Buffalo, Air North. Um, and last summer, EMCR made contact with most of them just to talk capacity, um, just to talk availability. Um, but we will refresh that list this year just to make sure we've got those same contacts made. So we are also have been in discussions, preliminary discussions with Yukon EMO just to chat about their availability to take us should we need to go north. So into Whitehorse. So we are starting those conversations as well. That is a highly unlikely scenario though as the season continues because their commercial lodging is almost at 100% through the summer months due to tourists. So I have a question. can't sure. read uh, the green screen there, but okay, go yeah. ahead, Mayor. Thank you. So um, Aaron, have we spoken to some of these contractors uh, the Fort Nelson First Nation about their bus, the Senior Society bus, the hotels uh, about using their buses because they might have a plan of their own. Uh, you know, if we're relying on them, we need to know, or they need to know that we'll, there's an expectation that we'll be relying on them for some service. So I'm just wondering about our interaction with them. We don't tend to rely on the senior society bus um, because we know Northern Health needs that bus. So we tend to sort of leave that one to Northern Health um, until they're done with it. And then we would utilize it wherever possible. We haven't chatted with the hotels this year, but that is on our, our list to re-engage with the hotels. Um, in prior years, we had chatted with the senior society. Um, we've chatted with Diversified. We've chatted with FNFN quite a bit about um, their bus. And we don't count their bus as our resource. That's their resource. Um, but yeah, we do have to re-engage with all of these um, community partners and we have, we're starting to engage with some of them this week actually because we're doing our um, evacuation tabletop exercise planning. So we are meeting with a number of our community groups on Wednesday um, and James and I are scheduled to meet with the Senior Society, the Literacy Society, Grace Manor and uh, the Lamplighters. So just to sort of chat about their needs and about um, especially with the senior society about their bus and, and let them know that we don't have, um, we're not counting their bus as our resource. Their bus is, Northern Health has said that they would require that bus for helping to move the patients, especially from the hospital to the airport where they would be transported by air. So. Right. Oh uh, yeah. Cause I, I mean, as long as, as long as they know that, that, uh, you know, yes. uh, what, I, what I'd hate to see is that, you know, they throw a bunch of people into one of these shuttle buses and they're gone out of the community. And, yeah. you know, there was an expectation that we were going to, on their own, based on their own evacuation plan, right? Yeah. That they, yeah. they had a plan that they decided what they were going to do or the residents got together and said, let's get the heck out of here. And, uh, and they use one of those, those buses to do that when, you know, when there's an expectation that, that we might need it uh, as a community resource. So, oh, I'm, I'm glad that you're, uh, yeah. that you're going to engage with them over the over the next little while. Thanks. Yeah, you bet. 
Um, so I also wanted to chat a little bit about what I call the reality of ESS. <laughs> so <laughs> a lot of people may have a, um, a vision of what, if you are evacuated, what the province is going to provide um, to you. Um, those communities who have been evacuated know that often your expectations and realities are quite far apart. So I just want to prepare um, people and get the message out there. Um, as I mentioned before, we will most likely not all be going to the same community. Uh, there is not a community in the north that has over 1,300 hotel rooms that could assist us. Um, if you are evacuated under the provincial rules, you are entitled to a number of uh, pieces of assistance. The first one is I'll call meal slash food assistance. You have two choices with meal food assistance. You can get a restaurant or a grocery daily rate. With the restaurant, your daily rate is $53 per person. That's it. For three meals in eating in a restaurant, your grocery daily rate is $22.50 per person. So if you're a family of five, you're going to get five times $22.50. If you're a family of one, you're going to get $22.50 per day if you go to buy your groceries. The other option, the other, sorry, the other um, assistance that they do provide is accommodation assistance. This one is a little bit more flexible. Um, that accommodation assistance is usually paid at the provincial government range from pre-arranged suppliers. And you're going to be staying in a, either a hotel or a motel of the community's choice, not your own personal choice. Um, you could be staying at uh, B&Bs, or if you are, if you have your RV, you can also stay at RV campgrounds. You can also stay at BC parks. That is also eligible for ESS. Um, if you have a pet, there is no guarantee that you're going to be able to get a pet friendly room. So you have to always keep that in mind. Billeting in private homes is also available. And unfortunately, so is group lodging. So group lodging um, consists of pretty much what it says. You are staying in a group lodging facility. Most recently, the province has acquired or leased for the wildfire season several out-of-use oil camps or work camps. So you are in a bucking horse style camp, um, and that is your group lodging facility where you're provided with uh, perhaps a canteen for food and, and meals. So the reality doesn't look pretty. When you think about where you could be going, the reality also isn't very pretty when you think about if we're not the first community to evacuate, maybe we're the eighth. In a bad year and all of those commercial lodging facilities are taken. That means we are most likely going to group lodging. So um, in addition to meals and accommodation, you can receive up to $150 per person for clothing when evacuees did not have sufficient time to pack. For transportation, it's to meet immediate needs only. They will purchase bus passes, minimal taxis, or fuel for evacuation in the case of a community such as ours. That is not a standard. The folks in Tumbler Ridge got $50 to evacuate from Tumbler Ridge to Fort St. John. So our arrangement is not typical, It's given, but it's given our distance. Um, you also will receive up to $50 per person for incidentals, which are things such as laundry services, personal hygiene, and pet food, stuff like that. There are also some supplemental supports at reception centers, such as mental health and pet care. And often there are groups that come forward with pet care, um, and they'll offer to take care of pets for those evacuees who couldn't get a pet-friendly room, or they exceed the allowable number of pets or the types of pets. People evacuate with chickens. So, you know, you don't put chickens in hotel rooms. So usually lots of um, community members at the destination come forward to assist evacuees with um, extraordinary needs such as that. The province has been uh, made aware, <laughs> acutely aware that this program is not sufficient. It does not meet the current needs in our inflationary times. So the rates and the program are currently under review. It is highly unlikely that that will be completed this summer. <clears throat> so, residents are highly encouraged to make their own arrangements with friends and family um, in other communities in the event of an evacuation. If um, in the event of a busy wildfire season, being sent to group lodging is highly likely. That is, of course, none of our, our first choice. Emergency support services are not designed to provide everything a person needs. They are essentially a short-term bridge. 
um, part of our education campaign this spring is going to get the community to prepare grab and go bags to be as prepared as possible, not only for at the destination, but that trip, that four, eight hour trip to get from here to wherever we need to go to have some things to keep your family comfortable, safe, water, a little bit of food, all of the things that you're going to need when you get to your destination, such as your prescriptions, such as your contact list for emergency contacts back in the community. Um, copies of your homeowner and tenant insurance policies. Because a little known fact, many of them cover evacuation. So check your homeowner's insurance because it covers evacuation at a greater level than what the province is going to give you in terms of reimbursement. So check your homeowner's policy. If you're a tenant and you have a tenant policy, check that as well. It may also cover evacuation. Um, if residents have RVs, they can be utilized and campground fees are eligible for ESS. We do have planned RV stops along both the north and south evacuation routes. Um, we're also participating in what's called the Electronic Registration and Assistance Tool or ERA for short. And residents can pre-register. So you can pre-register as, as a resident of Port Nelson. Um, if you have your BC Services Card app, you are eligible through the ERA tool to verify your identity, and then you can receive electronic fund transfers for many of your ESS um, uh, cost supports. So you don't have to go to that restaurant with the piece of paper that says, you know, I have a, a referral for breakfast or a referral for lunch. You're able to receive those um, electronically in your bank account. You have more choice that way. Um, and last year, remote ESS registration may be available. So if you are an RV owner and you decide you're going to stop at Bucky Horse, you're not going to go all the way. Um, we'll have an internet stop down there. You can get online, call somebody, do your ESS registration, and you're done. You don't have to travel all the way to that reception center in Port St. So, so I'm going to just chat a little bit about evacuation refusals or um, often called stand their ground. So evacuation is not legally mandatory and I have an asterisk beside that because there are some situations in which it is. One of the biggest one is minor children. So minor children cannot remain in, in an evacuation order area. Um, it's general knowledge amongst emergency management that five to 10 feet, five to 10 percent of people will refuse to evacuate for whatever reason. Um, those who choose to remain is really important. And the folks that are doing the door knocking, um, they are given a bit of a script. So they're basically told that if you come to a door and your the individuals tell you that they're not evacuating, we ask for the name of the dentist because we need dental records because it emergency services will not be coming if something happens. Um, it is really important that anybody who refuses to evacuate has a full understanding of the, de the ramifications of that decision. So those who choose to remain will not have access to groceries or other any retail services. Power may be lost, of course. We all live in this community. Ambulance and medical services are suspended. So um, the, the hospital is closed. Um, BC Ambulance actually situates, they are not allowed to be within an evacuation order area. So BC Ambulance exits the community. They actually situate themselves outside of the order area. Um, residents who remain are restricted to their own property because the community is still on evacuation order. You cannot roam about the community. Um, you cannot come and go in will unless you have a a very valid reason to exit the evacuation order and then request to come back in. The community, if possible, will be secured and patrolled by the RCMP. And structural protection equipment, if it is uh, strung across roads, you cannot travel down that road by a vehicle because you know, there's going to be hoses every 30 feet or so. So it is important that people understand. Um, it is more common in rural areas that people stay um, and st protect their own property they also have a little bit better of a escape route if you are in rural property versus somebody who's in more of an urban an urban home. So there are people that do refuse to evacuate. So it is a it is a reality and and we just work with whatever we're given to work with. So but it is our job to secure the community so we don't have people just roaming the community and taking things. Um 
So let's chat a little bit about EOC staff and governance. So if safe to do so, EOC staff do remain in the community. Um, they are one of the last to leave. The um, safety of the EOC staff basically goes into BC wildfire hands um, that they're doing the hazard assessment and they would issue that notice that when EOC staff have to leave, that's, they do it on BC wildfires, basically. They would say, go, we would leave. Um, governance services are reduced to critical and essential only, and if required, will be established and ran from a neighboring community, and our procedure bylaw does permit electronic meeting participation. Um, our EOC is also essentially portable, um, and it could be established elsewhere uh, if required, such as the community hall in Toad River. So. Stage three, the happy stage. <laughs> Everybody's coming home. So uh, when we rescind an evacuation, uh, first off, the community would need to be deemed safe from hazards and safe to re-enter. We would need to ensure that we have safe utility supply. So power, water, and natural gas. Those two utilities um, for power and natural gas are responsible for ensuring that all of their infrastructure is safe and that the connections to the home are safe. We would be responsible for ensuring that the water supply is safe. If at any time that water supply became unmonitored, i.e. our we had to leave, like all of us are had to leave and our, our water supply became unmonitored, it's usually about a minimum of four to five days of just doing assurance of that water supply before we would even be able to reintroduce people because we would have to go through that recertification stage again. Um, many communities have done things such as stage returns with service suppliers, let in grocery suppliers first, let in the power and utility companies, let in natural gas, um, to get the community ready before all the people come in. Um, if widespread long-term power loss was experienced, we would need to develop methods and provide the resources to collect and dispose of what is now hazardous material. So refrigerators, freezers, anything like that. Um, and at that point, we would begin our recovery process. So. That is the basics of the um, evacuation presentation. I have a very short emergency preparedness presentation as well, because I always like to help that horn whenever I can. <laughs> okay, and I, think I will. We be, have time. So. I will be quick. Okay. Yep. Okay. So um, one of the things we always ask people is, have you ever thought about how you prepare for an emergency? What if you didn't have electricity or water for three days or two weeks? If you had to leave your home on short notice or you needed to contact your family and get official information during an emergency. So again, I, I like these three-step processes. They're really simple. The first one is know your hazards. I've already showed you your hazards. Everybody knows what those are, but I'll just show them to you again. So. Again, it's that same list of, of, of 10 top hazards that we have. Um, step two is make a plan. <clears throat> and this is where the province has come in very handy. They've provided you a fill in the blank home emergency plan along with a guide on how to do it. <laughs> so it's super easy. You just have to sit down with your family, with your loved ones, with your partner, with yourself, and just go through this plan. And it, it has little prompts on questions and it, it's really, really simple to do. You're gonna grab a copy of it. You're gonna sign up for Voyant Alert. You're gonna gather your important information and documents, including a copy of your home insurance, a copy of your driver's license and any other pertinent ID that you have. You're gonna sit with your family. You're gonna fill out the plan and you're gonna pre-register for emergency support services using the ERA app. Can I ask a question, please? Yes. So you say pre-register for emergency support services using the electronic registration and assistance app. Like when? Like now? At any time like you like. You can do it. You can at any do time. it tonight. Okay. Yeah. All right. Then. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Step three. We're already on the third step. <laughs> See how fast this is going to be. Um, there are actually two different types of home emergency kits. The first one is. If you're going to be at home, um, in your home, again, it's like that shelter in place type of a situation. This would be utilized in earthquakes, um, disease outbreaks, severe weather, power outages, and hazardous material spills. You're gonna wanna try to have three days to two weeks worth of supplies to keep everybody um, safe and comfortable. So you're gonna have things such as first aid kits, prescriptions, uh, battery powered or a hand crank radio, um, a phone charger, your emergency plan that's already filled out, garbage bags, um, 
clothing, water for three days to two weeks, don't forget pets, and non-perishable food and a method to heat it because you may not have power. So that's that big bucket that I encourage people to have in their in their home. That's kind of like your, I'll call it the mini prepper kit. You're at home, but here's all the stuff that you have. The next kit that we are um, really going to be promoting at the trade fair on May 4th and 5th is going to be a grab and go bag. This is a smaller version of that big kit that you literally can grab and go. Um, and it's more relevant to wildfires, floods, tsunamis, landslides, where you are leaving in a hurry. So in that kit, it can be small. Um, at the trade fair on May 4th or 5th, if I haven't already mentioned it, you can get a free, we're calling it the preparedness pail. It is a bucket full of a number of preparedness items, but you can grab a, an old backpack and just fill it with those essentials it's a really small list, but it could make a huge difference, especially in that drive from here to Fort St. John. If your kids all have one and they've got a little comfort item in there, they got an activity book, they've got something that makes them feel safe and secure. They've got their favorite, whatever it is. Um, get that grab and go bag, one for every member of your household. Um, it's not, not a huge list and most people have a lot of these things just lined up. So we are really promoting this at the trade fair. May 4th and 5th. <laughs> May 4th and 5th. So um, over the years, I've made a few, a list of some things, because I know not everybody has the budget to go out and buy all of these new things. So I actually um, went out and I challenged myself for 20 bucks to see if I could create a grab and go bag. I went to the thrift store and I got an old backpack. I went to Red Apple. I went through the thrift store. And for 20 bucks, I created a grab and go bag. It wasn't, it wasn't too hard. You can also do these things over time. Um, you can do them in stages. So assemble this thing in stages. Thrift stores are a great source of, of old backpacks. You know, you can refresh a water bottle, find some extra clothes. Dollar store, red apple, fields, clearance sections. Gather supplies you already have at home, extra phone chargers, some toilet paper, paper towel, old washcloths, a pen and a notebook if you didn't come and get my free fill in the blank one. Um, you can clean and sanitize plastic water bottles and use them at home. Just use the water from your tap, but just bleach the water bottle, change it every six months. You don't have to go out and buy new water. You can get a free radio app on your phone. If you have a smartphone, you can actually download a free radio app. Um, and if you can't do that at minimum, I ask people just make a list of those critical things in your, in your home and where are they? So if I tell you, you got 15 minutes, you need to get out. You're gonna to go to that piece of paper and in your panic mode, you got a checklist. Okay, I need my medications, I need dog food. I need to get my copy of my passport, you know, whatever that list is for you. But just write it down on a piece of paper and put it by the door so that if you're packing yourself or if somebody's helping you, they can help you pack in a hurry. And again, visit us at the trade. <laughs> so. Um, if people want more information, they can get uh, lots of information online at Prepared BC, including electronic copies of these brochures, several others that we have, including a wildfire preparedness guide, an extreme heat preparedness guide. A copy of all of these will be in the preparedness bucket that you're going to come get at the trade fair as well. <clears throat> <laughs> Along with a help okay sign if you need it. Um, you could also go follow Prepared BC on uh, X, Facebook, Instagram, pop into Town Hall. We got lots of copies here. Visit us at the trade fair. And um, we're making arrangements to do some community events for Emergency Preparedness Week, which is May 5th to the 11th. So, and that's it. Okay. Questions, comments? I have, oh, you want to go? I just had one comment. I seen it online the other day. How many people have empty mason jars just storing in their house? Fill them with water. Um, storing them in. Good. So two comments. What's the plan for if we lose phone and internet services? Like, we have a couple of different options. So one of the main options we have, um, people could ensure that they've got voice over IP turned on on a smartphone so they could use, if they have a standalone internet service like Starlink that you could power with a generator, you could still use voice over IP. It would only work for a little while though um, because if we lost complete phone and cellular service, at some point your phone does need to connect to a cellular network. 
So if that cellular network is down, it may last for, we don't know how long, but it will work for a short period of time. That's all right. Sorry, but yeah. that's if they are trying to use your phone as a phone number. You're Versus still, you still have things you like still have internet. Zoom, FaceTime, there's yeah. other mechanisms. Skype. Audio, audio yeah. volume um, for, for FaceTime audio, for example, if you have internet service again. Through a standalone, through a standalone. Provider. So I was kind of thinking like the NRMs plan. So, I mean, mm -hmm. we would maybe have to up the door to door notifications then. We would absolutely we... update. We would, yeah, bring up the door to door notifications through the loudspeakers, through the community, do printed notices. We've done those a number of times for um, different things that have happened on road closures. We've done the printed notices. Um, we also have, in terms of communicating with our partners with our emergency services, we've been establishing a uh, push to talk satellite radio system so that we can communicate with other agencies. Okay. And yeah. then my other point is just a, a hint. Last year when we were had all the wildfires and I have a medication that typically my, um, um, my service provider will only allow me to fill every month, right? So, but I said, well, like we're in wildfire season, like, and so they gave me six months supply. So it's just something that if anybody, it's just a hint, if you have that ongoing, medication thing that they make you fill every single month. Um, yeah. It's interesting, just a couple of years ago as well, um, the, let's say it's something like the BC College of Physicians for Pharmacists, um, they put in a new rule that um, if you are an evacuee and you go to a pharmacy, um, you used to have to get like a referral from emergency services to confirm your medication, then you have to go to a pharmacist. They now no longer do that. You just walk into a pharmacist with a copy of your prescription bottle, and they now have an emergency order that they can do, and they can just issue you your prescription without going through all of that red tape. So they can issue you a short supply of your prescription now if you're an evacuee. So it makes that a lot easier for people. Mayor, did you have anything to add? Uh, I did. Um, <clears throat> uh, excellent presentation, Aaron.